Hi, this is Mrs. Jones. I'm here with another Common Core lesson that you can adapt for all ages of students uh, for mathematics. Um, the Common Core has some overarching um, ideas that are common to kindergarten through grade 12 instruction. It's what makes great mathematics instruction in school. And two of these are model with mathematics and construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others. And these can often be kind of challenging to get into your math class, but this particular activity is going to help you do that. And it's called Jack and Jill Problems. Now, I realize that Jack and Jill Problems would not probably get your high school students really excited about math, but you can definitely change the, uh, the two people to Snooky and JWoww, or Lewis and Clark, or use a couple of your students' names, Calvin and Hobbes, whatever you'd like to do. The point is that you're going to have here two people, either real or fictional, that are each going to solve the same problem in different ways. So here we have an example that would be um, a middle school level. Um, Jack says 10 to the fourth power is 10,000. Jill says 10 to the fourth power is 100,000. Now with this activity, it's best in your, to place it in your math unit um, in a place where uh, it's just after you've introduced a skill, but it's not that the, the students haven't really firm yet. Your, your goal with your Jack and Jill problems is to uncover those common misconceptions that students have. So you want to have one answer that's correct, and your other answer is going to be incorrect, but you specifically want your incorrect answer to be something that the students are likely to do. Here's another example with um, borrowing, which is a very common, um, common skill for second and third graders. Jack says 50 minus 13 is 43. Jill says 50 minus 13 is 37. And you notice that Jack has made a common error here. Um, he said 3 minus 0 is 3, and 5 take away 1 is 4. Um, it doesn't matter who's right, Jack or Jill, you want to vary it up. Um, but this gives you an example of what it looks like. And I have this on a board here, but it's best if you put this on a whiteboard, or you can also use your smart board. Jack and Jill problems have three steps or stages, and these can take really as long as you want them to take. The first one is where you have you display your Jack and Jill problem, and you have the students come up and make their best guess. And what they would do is they would sign their name under the problem they think is correct without really looking through it um, incredibly closely. Then they go back to their seats, and they have to prove it to themselves. Students can either do this in a Jack and Jill journal, they can do it just on a piece of lined paper, or they, my kids love to use uh, personal whiteboards for this, where they actually do out the problem, and I encourage them to come up with a couple of different ways to show the answer. I ask them to do once mathematically and then once with some sort of pictures or drawings. Um, at this point, if they find that the answer that they thought was, was correct was not, they are free to come up, erase their name, and move it over to a different side. Once every student has had a chance to show at least one way to solve the problem, then they have to prove it with a partner. If you have an equal number of Jacks and Jills, it's very easy. Just have, for example, all of your Jacks stand up and have them each pick a Jill partner. And each partner is supposed to try to prove to the other one that their way is right. If you happen to have uh, an overabundance of Jacks and not very many Jills, or the opposite, lots and lots of Jills and very few Jacks, um, then you want to probably have kids get together in groups or two teams and decide who um, can show it the best. But you really want them to focus on this constructing viable arguments and critiquing the reasoning of others piece. And again, at this point, if students feel like, wow, my partner really convinced me that I was in the wrong, they can move their names back and forth. Now, some interesting things I found with using, using Jack and Jill problems, the first time or two that you use them, be prepared that students will be very easily swayed. Just because I think kids just love coming up and writing their name in different places. They just think that's fun. And they're also very much swayed by public opinion, by what others have to say, and, and peer pressure, quite frankly. But as you incorporate Jack and Jill problems, and I would do this at least a couple of times in each unit, 
you're going to find that more and more kids are going to be able to stand up for the correct answer, that they'll be better at showing and explaining and modeling their mathematics as you go along, and they'll be less and less swayed by other kids um, and, and peer pressure. And it's a great fun activity that takes very little preparation. <clears throat> so one more time, our, our two overarching standards are model with mathematics, constructing viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others, and our three-step process to Jack and Jill problems. Give it your best guess, write it down, prove it to yourself, move yourself if you need to, and finally prove it with a partner or with a team, and again, move yourself if you want to. Thank you so much for watching, and have a great day.